This is a Wool Observatory podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Welcome to Star Hello and welcome to Star Stuff. This is your host, Cody Half Moon, and my lovely co host, Haley Osborne. Hello. And Good today <laughs> um, we're, t- we're talking about can I say Uncle Percy on this? Absolutely. We're talking about good old Uncle Percy. Uncle Percy. Which is not as weird as it sounds. That is Lil Percival, mm-hmm. our beloved founder. Yes. Um, and I only know stuff about Percy from like our lo- public program, so. I know so much about Percival. So much. <laughs> <laughs> Too so, much. Um, we're going to try to fit a bunch of information into half an hour. That is our goal today. Yes. So are you ready for this? I'm we're so ready. rapid fire some stuff. Jam-packed. Uncle Percy Day. We got this. Um, So I started off with uh, Percival Lowell's family history because I figured that was probably uh, the best place to start. Um, I I usually like starting with people's like family and then building on to their career and everything. Yeah, let's dox him. (laughs) So uh, Percival Lowell, he had. uh, (laughs) I'm laughing at Nate. We're laughing at Nate. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So Percival Lowell had four siblings. He had uh, three sisters and one brother. Um, he, Aww. yeah, yeah. Girl house. Girl house. Aww. And, uh, he was, uh, older, uh, than most of them. Um, Abbott Lawrence Lowell was his brother and he was actually the president of Harvard University for a while. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, next well, up. So, oh, to 1933. Cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, was it like he was living up to his, was it his older brother? And he was like, oh, my older brother is president of Harvard. I have to do something. Oh, no, 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 no. Percival was older than uh, Oh, Abbott. okay. Yeah, 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 Percival was older. So um, Abbott Lawrence Lowell, uh, he was the president of Harvard University. Um, he uh, later in life actually helped us build the Pluto Discovery Astrograph. It, uh, it's, oh. its official name is actually the Abbott Lawrence Lowell Astrograph. No kidding. Um, because he funded it because uh, we were doing – Oh. In, uh, not great in during then that time period for funding um and the so the depression yeah <laughs> yeah um but yeah and then he had his three sisters um the one i usually bring up first is actually his youngest sister amy lowell um because she went on to be a pulitzer prize winning poet <gasps> Yeah. Amy. Yeah. Oh, that's so, so cool. Um, it was really cool because um, if you think about it, we're we're talking like late 1800s here. Yeah. And so typically with um, prominent families like this, um, I don't know, I, I recently got kind of into like Bridgerton and it kind of reminded me of Girl. Um, the whole uh, like uh, Lowell family. Um, A good reason to watch the D&D movie. <laughs> Ooh. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, I'm excited. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Uh, the big thing with like prominent families like this is typically with eldest daughters, their job was to find a suitable match and marry into another wealthy family and mm-hmm. continue on the legacy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Transfer that was ownership thing. to another man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll um, say it. I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> Um, but since Amy Lowell was the uh, youngest of the three, uh, that that burden didn't really fall on her too mm. much. And so she decided to go more into the um, – like. I don't want to say like arts. academia, but like arts gotcha. route. Yeah. And so she became a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. Man, it's giving like Emily Dickinson. That's yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's very cool. similar. Um, his Amy. middle sister, Elizabeth Lowell Putnam, um, that's so Lowell Putnam, um, the ownership, uh, the trusteeship of the observatory has passed through her children uh, because Percival never had children. So, um, but the cool thing about her that I actually learned fairly recently, I've been here for six years and I learned this like last year. Um, she was one of the first uh, activists for prenatal care. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So like, uh, cool. like, like taking care of yourself while like carrying a child and everything, all that stuff, uh, the vitamins, the the eating right, things like that. Oh. She was one of the first activists for that kind of stuff. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, that was pretty cool. And then um, his, uh, the oldest of the three uh, was Catherine Lowell. And um, mm-hmm. I didn't find a ton on her. Um, it seems that she just, you know, married into another wealthy family, had some kids, yeah. um, the usual thing that women did around that time. If anyone knows any hot goss on Catherine Lowell, they sent it our way. <laughs> um, but if we go, um, 
further back in time, uh, we can talk about his uh, grandparents, Percival Lowell's grandparents. Okay. Um, so his grandfather on his father's side was... This would be like early 1800s. Yeah, this yeah. is like early 1800s. Um, his grandfather on his father's side was John Amory Lowell, and he's the one who founded the textile mills in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is where oh, the Lowell family got a lot of money. Is that where that money is? Money. Yes. Okay. I w- always yes. wondered where the money came from because yeah. it's no secret, and I don't want to sugarcoat it, that... We were able to start because of a, a like, family wealth. Yes. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Uh, so um, I was curious where that came from. Yeah. So he, yeah. he actually, um, from what I've heard from, um, like, Kevin Schindler and other educators um, while I was learning about all this um, – Apparently, he had a photographic memory, and he traveled over to England and toured their textile mills and then came back here and recreated them. And he essentially set off the Industrial Revolution by doing that. So they were like Rockefeller wealthy, right? They had lots of money. Wow. Yeah. And that's how um, uh, Percival and his siblings were able to do so many things. Um, They did a lot of traveling in their younger years. Um, uh, It's actually really funny because apparently when they were younger – Percival hated traveling. Every time they like went overseas or whatever, Percival was just like, "Do I have to go?" You know that kind of thing. <laughs> Come um, on, Percy, get in the boat. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, "I don't want to." Um, but in his later years, um, after he graduated Harvard, he got his PhD in mathematics. Um, he traveled on his own to kind of like find himself and figure out what he wanted to do with his inheritance. Oh, he had a little gap year. Yeah, he That's had a couple cute. gap years. Um, <laughs> a and couple he, gap years. Yeah, it was it was quite a few years that he traveled. He went all over the place. Uh, he wrote some books about his travels. I didn't know he had a PhD. Yeah, yeah, PhD oh. in mathematics. Look um, at him go. Okay. So it's actually really funny because um, in his will he stated – Um, In order to be considered an astronomer at Lowell Observatory, you have to have a PhD in uh, astronomy or astrophysics, right? Mm -hmm. That that was like in his will. Yeah. Percival Lowell was not an astronomer according to his own definition. Right. He never got a higher degree in astronomy. His higher degree was in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So he was a mathematician. And I think that goes for our executive director role too, which was previously just director. Like to be director of Lowell, Mm -hmm. you have to be like a scientific like a star. Sorry for the sniffles. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. The pollen count's really high today. So oh my god, I know. I'm over here like (laughs) um, I promise I'm not sick, but yeah. Um, And then his grandfather on his mother's side, Abbott Lawrence, was the ambassador to the United Kingdom as well as a congressman and industrialist. So he was more into like the political side of things. Wait. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What was his name? Abbott Lawrence. Oh, okay. So his younger brother was named after him. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, And so Percival- like a highfalutin, um, fancy, well-known family. Very much Family. They were a very well-known family, yes. Was he the rogue, like, going off to the Southwest? Arizona was not a state yet, by the way, when he built Lowell Mm -hmm. Observatory. Was he just like, I'm going to build a telescope out in the middle of the desert? We'll get to that. Okay. Um, Because what I wanted to mention is um, Sounds like rebellion behavior to me. Right? (laughs) Percival actually kind of followed in his uh, grandfather Abbott Lawrence's footsteps because he was actually the ambassador to the Noto region in Japan for a while. The what? The Noto region in Japan. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So he he was... um, a lot of people described Percival as a very charismatic guy, as a very, um, like, happy guy. Um, one of his favorite things to do was where whenever he would travel, he would actually bring his telescope with him, and he would, like, set it up in the middle of a busy square and let anyone and everyone come and look through the telescope. That's cute. Yeah. There's a photo. Um, so the marketing team is in this old, old house on mm-hmm. campus, and one of my favorite photos of Percy is him standing on the roof of this building dressed as Santa. Yep. Like, Flailing his arms yep. in the air. Very on brand for personal. Very on brand for Lowell Observatory. Oh, yeah. Too. That too. <laughs> yeah, we don't allow anyone to work here who's not a complete character. Oh, uh, yeah. In honor of, of Uncle Percival. Percy. Yeah, mm-hmm. 100%. Uncle Percy. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so he he traveled all over the place um, mm-hmm. after he got his PhD. His favorite places to go were actually Japan and Korea. And so a lot of his books that he wrote were on Japan and Korea. What a sweetheart. Mm-hmm. I want to go to Japan. I know, right? We should go together. Let's do it. <laughs> I bet he would have been like an anime nerd. If if it was a thing. Oh, yeah. I feel like I feel like Percival would be into that. He'd be into anime. Yeah. Oh, sweetheart. <laughs> That's so cool. I love it. Um, but yeah, so he, he uh, graduated from 
the Noble and Green Knoll School in 1872 and Harvard University in 1876 with a distinction in mathematics. Um, He was later awarded honorary degrees from Amherst uh, College and Clark University. Hmm. So um, very well-known guy, uh, traveled all over the place, wrote loads of books during his lifetime about all kinds of stuff. Manic Um, pixie dream nerd. (laughs) We got it. Cool. (laughs) I love that. Um, but yeah, he, he was just, he was, a, he was a character. That's definitely like a good way to describe him. You know, yeah. he, he liked doing a lot of things. Um, later in life, he ran a cotton mill for six years after graduation. Um, so he did that in the 1880s. He traveled extensively in the far East. So like I said, mostly, uh, Japan and Korea, um, August, 1883, he served as a foreign secretary and counselor for a special Korean diplomatic mission to the United States. So, um, he was also into that kind of stuff. Um, but the really cool thing that I actually didn't know until I was preparing for this episode, um, is even though he was into like all this political discourse and everything, he was a devout pacifist. Oh, really? Yeah. Cause I was going to ask, where was the cotton mill? I have no idea. Oh, okay. He was a pacifist. He was a pacifist. I like that. Yeah. Um, and I like in fact, um, uh, actually, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get there in okay. a few minutes. Um, but he uh, lived in Korea for about two months. Um, he also spent significant periods of time in Japan writing books on Japanese religion, psychology, and behavior. Um, really? Yeah. His texts are filled with observations and academic discussions of various aspects in Japanese life, um, including language, religious <gasps> practices, economics, travel in Japan, and development of personality. My obsession with Japan, meet first of all. all. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So um, I, I think we actually have copies of those books in the collection center. Really? I think so. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. We um, should do like an exhibit on his, on uh, his writings love of and Japan. Stuff. Yeah, totally. Um, there's actually on the way up to the Clark, there's a, um, like wooden frame. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but I it's, have. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's half in English, half in Japanese. Um, mm-hmm. so there was a town that he frequented in Japan and I, I, it's been six years and I literally can't remember the name of the town. I've got too much stuff <laughs> in my brain, but, um, they, they call us their sister city. Yeah. yeah. And when they That's heard really that cool. Percival passed away, they actually sent that monument over oh. and there's a matching one in that city. That's really cool. Yeah. It's really cute. Um, but he was also a very distinguished person. He had a lot of awards. Um, he was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1892. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he moved back to the United States in 1893. Okay. And so this is where he starts to realize, oh, I, I think I know what I want to do with my um, with my money, mm-hmm. right? Because um, I don't know if uh, listeners, you guys know this or anything, but the observatory was founded in 1894. Mm-hmm. So it was a year after moving back from the United States that he founded this observatory. Mm-hmm. So he came back um, for numerous reasons. Um, one of the main reasons is he wanted – to build a public observatory. Um, like I said, one of his favorite pastimes was bringing a telescope out into the middle of a busy square, letting anyone come and look through it. Um, that uh, public observatories didn't really exist at the time. Right. I was just about to ask, because mm-hmm. I know like Griffith and Kit Peak are, are relatively old. Mm-hmm. Um, and that started from the same, like, we want this to be available, or at least Griffith did. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're good friends of Griffith Observatory. Shout yes. out to our friends at Griffith in LA. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I guess, um, was that, I wonder if that was like kind of a fad then, or if he was the pioneer in this? So from what I was reading, it seems that Lowell was kind of the first to do this, Mm -hmm. but others quickly followed suit. You know what I mean? Um, Because at the time, observatories were for astronomers doing Mm -hmm. astronomy research. And so they were parts of like universities or governments. And still um, are. And still are. A lot of them still are um, and are not open to the public, right? And so Percival, he thought, well, I want to build a public observatory. I want to build an observatory where anyone with any background can come and look through a telescope. And so he set out to build the perfect observatory. And And he did it. He did. (laughs) Um, So... um, 
the big things that you're looking for when it comes to building an observatory, um, he did a lot of research into the topic. He also had a friend at Harvard who wrote his PhD thesis on how to build the perfect observatory. So he had mm-hmm. like a lot of background um, and he made basically like a list. Sounds of like a listicle you'd find on like BuzzFeed. Exactly. <laughs> it, 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 Seven it, ways to build the perfect observatory. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Researchers hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Little clickbait article. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, I mean, Lowell's not anything but clickbait. Fair. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get into that. <laughs> anyway, um, so the um, the first thing you want to look for, or the first thing that they were looking for, was you want low humidity because mm-hmm. the higher the humidity is, the easier it is to condense water on your lens or mirror, mm-hmm. and you can totally damage your telescope. Yeah, thanks. I hate it. My skin is <laughs> <Yeah>. so dry. <laughs> And so that's how we ended up in the Southwest, right? Thanks, because the Lord. Southwest is like known for being a dry, arid area, right? It's um, so dry. And so this all uh, happened back in 1894. This was before Arizona was a state. We mm-hmm. were still a territory at the time. And so um, Percival, he sent his colleague, Andrew Douglas, out here to the Southwest to kind of scout out the region and um, figure out where would be the best place to mm-hmm. go. And so uh, things that he was looking for is uh, the low humidity. You also want to be at a high elevation because the higher up you are, the less atmosphere you have to look through. Mm -hmm. And so you can get uh, clearer views, right? Mm -hmm. And so Andrew Douglas, he started off down in Tombstone, worked his way up through Tempe, Tucson, Prescott, and finally here to Flagstaff. And when he got here, he said it was the best seeing conditions he had ever experienced. So um, that's that's because we follow – here in Flagstaff, we have – Pretty much all the conditions that Percival was looking for. Yeah. So uh, where we are, where we are right now on Mars Hill, we're at about seventy two hundred feet elevation. So we're higher up, less atmosphere to look through. Um, we are a dry, arid climate most of the time. Of course, we do get snow and everything being in the mountains, but for the most part, uh, we are not very humid here. Yeah. Even um, when it snows, like I was even telling when it snows, it's not um, very humid. my mother in Houston, um, I was like, I'm outside right now and there's snow on the ground and I'm not wearing a jacket. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's so dry. (laughs) Yeah, it's so dry. Um, Another thing you want to look for is you want low light pollution. Mm -hmm. Um, The lower the light pollution is, the better the seeing is. We've talked about this extensively, especially on our episodes with uh, Dark Sky Ranger, Raider Lane. Raider Lane. (laughs) Yeah. I love him. We've talked about this quite a bit. Um, But back then, um, so Flagstaff right now is an international dark sky city. We were the first international dark sky city. Back then, we were a logging community of 800 people, and there was no electricity in Flagstaff. Right. So that's about Shout as to dark the, as you can get. The Reardons, by the yes. way. I love them. Absolutely. Um, and so um, we had low light pollution, high elevation, uh, low humidity. Andrew Douglas got here, and he was like, beautiful seeing conditions. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let Percival know. Mary and, Sioux City. Yeah. That's us. Perfect. And so um, he wrote to Percival, and he said, hey, I've found where you're going to put your observatory. Uh, so Percival borrowed two telescopes from Harvard University to scout out the region. He came out here As on the train. Um, that's another thing that they were looking for is there's a train that runs through town. So Thanks again to their Reardon. Yeah. I mean, very easily. Fantastic. The Reardon brothers. We love you, man. Love them. Um, and so, Sweet <laughs> and so um, Percival came out here with the two telescopes he had borrowed from Harvard. Um, he looked up. He wasn't. Um, he wasn't like a hundred percent convinced that Flagstaff was the place for his observatory. But he decided, you know what? I'm going to buy a telescope and a dome. If we find somewhere better, we're just going to move the observatory. Oh my God! Is that how we got up on like Humphreys or? We moved the observatory numerous times. Can you imagine having the funding to just move an entire observatory? <laughs> like we moved it to Mexico. I remember, Mex- like they moved, Mexico. they picked up the Clark. They picked Can up the Clark. Can you imagine this, like? Brilliant, sweetheart, but rich kid. And so they're like building all this stuff. And they're like, oh, we finally got it up. He's like, mm, let's move it. Let's go to Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> it's yep. like <laughs> insane. Percival. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> so cool. Um, but yeah, so they. Job um, security, I guess. Yeah. It's like, absolutely. let's move it here. Don't worry. He'll like change his mind in a week. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he ordered a telescope from uh, the finest lens crafters that like ever. We we still I love consider lens crafters. Them. Yeah. <laughs> Great, <laughs> they're still around. Not, not them. <laughs> oh, never mind. <laughs> not sponsored. <laughs> not a sponsor. Oh Sorry. man. <laughs> Um, no, so there's this company called Alvin, Alvin Clark and Sons, mm. and they are still considered today to be some of the finest lens crafters for telescopes, like ever. Um, they handpicked a piece of glass from France, brought it over here, 
like hand sanded it down, uh, put together all the pieces, put it on the train in pieces with a crew to set it all up on site. And they built the historic Clark telescope, a 24 inch refracting telescope. The glass there in the Clark is from France. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks France. (laughs) Merci. Yeah. And so they, um, they put together this telescope. Uh, they also ordered a dome from back East, um, uh, like Boston area. Mm -hmm. Boston. That Boston. Came out. Boston. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Boston. <laughs> Boston. <the Clark. laughs> and just as like for anyone who hasn't seen the Clark Telescope, it is literally Gorgeous. steampunk. Oh yeah. It is. I mean, like Victorian by definition. Mm-hmm. This Victorian. It's so cool. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so that it, it came out here in pieces uh, with a crew to set it up on site. Mm-hmm. So they put everything together. Um, went to put the dome over the telescope, and the telescope was too big to fit inside the dome. (laughs) Yeah, so I imagine someone lost their job that day, right? So everybody was, like, freaking out. They were like, what are we going to do? You know, we've got this huge telescope, no dome for it. Well, in France, they use meters. There was, like, some confusion. There was was confusion, some (laughs) conversion errors. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I wasn't here. (laughs) We'll we'll ask Kevin Schindler next time we see him. It's okay. He doesn't watch this episode. He won't be offended. (laughs) Um, and so Percival was like freaking out, right? Because this is a logging community. Um, a lot of the people here were very, um, like they, they really only did logging, uh, their entire lives. So he was like, nobody's going to know anything about building a telescope. All I know know is trees. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so he's like freaking out, walking around downtown one day, he comes across this bicycle repair shop. And in the window of this bicycle repair shop, there's a sign that says makers and menders of everything. Be careful how you market things. This is yes. a very good lesson yes. in honest marketing. So Percival walks in and he meets the Sykes brothers, Stanley and Godfrey Sykes. And he's like, hey, I read your sign. I need you to make me a telescope dome. Mm-hmm. Now, thankfully, the Sykes brothers, um, they're they're some of my favorite people. Their own brand of so chaos. Cool. They're so cool. Um, they, they were bicycle repairmen. But they were well-educated engineers from London who had come over here to live out their cowboy fantasy. <laughs> so, Same, I mean. <laughs> and so, like, even though they were bicycle repairmen by trade, they had a thorough knowledge of engineering. And so when Percival said, hey, can you build me a telescope dome? They were like, uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds super cool. And yeah, so they ball, did. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and so they That's did. That's the Flagstaff accent. If Literally. You, right. <laughs> mountain bikes. <laughs> Telescope, bra, bra, hang, hang, hey, hang ten or whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, so the Sykes brothers they built the dome that is uh, still standing today. Mm-hmm. It is made of local ponderosa pine wood from the surrounding forest because it is the most abundant material. Mm-hmm. Um, the issue with ponderosa pine is it's a pretty fragile and non-flexible wood, and so the reason that the Clark is bucket shaped and has all the internal like latticing structures inside is because the dome is essentially holding itself up. Um, that's how they made it happen. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy, pretty crazy. And, um, Fun. last I heard, I believe the wood is about 80% original. They had to change some out due to yeah. water damage, but most of it is the original structure, yeah. um, which is crazy to think about. I mean, it's been over a hundred years. Yeah. So. I know inside you can still see like math equations from like yeah. 1918 yep. that they penciled in on the walls. Mm-hmm. It's, it's cool. really cool. Um, and so, yeah, the Sykes brothers, uh, it they, like they built it. It does. Yeah. It looks like a bucket. I'll never see it. And the different. inside, if you look carefully, uh, especially if you're looking from like the middle, just directly up, looks like bicycle spokes. Oh, that is cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like Somebody this. pointed it out to me and I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to unsee that. It's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, so they, uh, they built the dome and, um, uh, Godfrey Sykes and Stanley Sykes were their names. Uh, Stanley Sykes was the younger brother. He continued working with us for a very long time. He actually helped build the Pluto Dome as well um, um, and the astrograph that's in there as well. Um, he continued working with us for quite some time. His brother, Godfrey Sykes, he actually developed a heart condition, so he had to move closer to sea level. Uh, that was pretty soon after building the Clark Dome, so he wasn't here for too much longer. But um, yeah, they, they decided to build uh, this this observatory for those reasons. And um, the the thing that I haven't touched on that I wanted to save until the end, I'm like, uh, I wrote this outline and I'm just like not even looking at it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to tell it the way I normally do. I don't know. <laughs> um, 
So the thing that I uh, typically like to talk about uh, kind of towards the end is uh, Percival's ulterior motive for building Lowell Observatory. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Percival Lowell, he did want a public observatory, right? But he also wanted an observatory uh, with a telescope that he could use for his research. Because like I said earlier, Percival Lowell was not an astronomer, right? Yep. And most of the telescopes that existed around the time were only for astronomers' use. And so Percival wanted his own telescope so that he could study Mars. Yes. <laughs> and he wanted to study Mars because of an Italian astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli. Um, what a name. I know, right? And I'm, I'm sure that there's a better way of pronouncing that. I just, I don't know Italian. So Schiaparelli. sorry if anybody is like... It's Schiaparelli. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, basically, he thought that there were uh, channels on the surface of Mars. He thought there were uh, canali on the surface of Mars, which roughly translates to channels. So uh, Schiaparelli thought that there were rivers on the surface of Mars. He thought there were water rivers on the surface of Mars. Mm -hmm. Well, Percival saw that and he said, no, I don't think those are channels. <coughs> <laughs> no <coughs> oh man sorry about that guys um my my voice just stopped working halfway through that sentence it's the um, aliens <laughs> um, they're like not our secrets and they're like no <laughs> um so percival saw that and he said i don't think those are channels i i, I think those are canals which indicates that something made them Mm -hmm. So he, um, That's my boy. Yeah, a lot of people think that he like mistakenly translated. He did not mistakenly translate anything. He purposefully said, "Those are not rivers. Those are canals. There are aliens on Mars." And he wrote so many books about this. Like Mars, the abode of life, was the title of one of his books. Like he wrote so many books about this, and he was convinced that there were uh, were like fully full Martian civilizations on mm -hmm. the surface of Mars, not just yep. like bacterial life forms or anything. He thought there were like walking, talking Martians on the surface of Mars. And I want to say like, if you're at home listening to this and you're rolling your eyes or whatever, mm -hmm. and you like Star Wars or Star Trek or Orson, like <laughs> you can like unroll those eyes because... I know, like, it started this huge marketing, because I studied this because mm -hmm. I have, obviously, an interest yeah. in the marketing, mm -hmm. um, like all the newspapers mm -hmm. and all of that. And, like, yeah. maybe some other observatories were like, you know, come on, guys. Well, we're, actually, we're astronomers, but. Um, Percival Lowell, he was credited by H.G. Wells, who wrote War of the Worlds, for inspiring him to write that book. Right, H.G. Wells. And Wells. that was like the beginning of aliens and science fiction. So yeah. literally, like if you enjoy alien movies, TV shows, comic books, whatever, mm -hmm. you can directly thank Percival Lowell for that. Right. Like he started that. And I just <laughs> attended, well, I just attended, gosh, this was like eight months ago, um, a presentation by the USGS mm -hmm. about the uh, the explorations happening right now on Mars mm -hmm. where they are collecting samples to study the water mm -hmm. that was on Mars looking for evidence of organic life. Yeah. So, But keep in mind that water existed well before Percival Lowell's time. Yeah. yeah like yeah. there was no yeah. No, he was, yeah, he was very and wrong. Yeah, he was And like but, like he's – I want to – But I the cannot, imagination cannot, of it. Yeah. And yeah. I cannot stress this enough. Like Percival Lowell was not crazy for this idea. No. Like a lot of people hear this and they're like, oh my gosh, like what a crazy old man. He was not crazy for this. A lot of people believed this. Mm -hmm. A lot of people saw these canal structures. And uh, the crazy thing about that is those canal structures do not exist. So there is a lot of discourse over what these people were actually seeing. Can we get a tin or like like a like a, a hat, like a tin hat? And then every time something happens, I can just like pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> be like, where did the canals go? Um, so there's actually two main theories about okay. the canals. Um, the first one is just psychology. You see what you want to see. So these people were looking for canals. Um, they were like looking for so long, like they they just like convinced themselves that there were these uh, canal systems on the surface, right? That's the first one. Uh, the second one is my favorite, though. It is that these people were looking in. Um, like such bright conditions with so much focus that they were actually seeing their capillaries, the inside of their eyeball on the surface of the planet. And if that's the case, we have 
hundreds of Mars globes that Percival Lowell drew. So we have intricate, detailed maps <laughs> of the inside of, of Percival Lowell's eyeball. eyeball. That's amazing. Yeah. That's my favorite. That's my favorite. So there's like there's yeah. a lot of theories about what these people were actually seeing um, mm-hmm. because it wasn't just Percival Lowell. Of course, there was uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were other people, um, whether they thought they were canals versus channels, a lot of people saw these structures on the surface of Mars. And well, so there's to be fair, a lot. Mars, like if you look through a telescope, even an advanced telescope, it's not like when you look through our telescopes and see Saturn, yeah. which is mind blowing, mm-hmm. or some other planets, you see mm-hmm. Mars and it's like, oh yeah, it's like a red yeah. circle. I mean, it's not... Mm-hmm. It's not like what NASA posts on their Instagram. Exactly. It's hard to see. Exactly. And so there was a lot of discourse about that. But like I I always like to stress like Percival Lowell was not crazy for thinking there were aliens on Mars. Like this was something that a lot of people believed back Mm -hmm. then. I mean, because if you think about it, we didn't have anything out at Mars. You know, we didn't we had never been to Mars. We had never been anywhere near Mars. All we had were people looking through telescopes and those people looking through telescopes whether they were convincing themselves, whether they were seeing their capillaries, whatever they were seeing, like they were seeing these things, yeah. you know? And that was so their truth. It makes sense that they would think, um, that they would think that there were some form of, uh, there was some form of life on Mars. Cool. So, Dope. but yeah, um, now I just want to, uh, quickly wrap up because uh nate is doing a little dancey yep. dance nate's over there. doing his time's up dance <laughs> do it do it for the people do the time's up dance I'm just kidding. he's shaking his head he's like i'm not gonna dance for you guys <laughs> um not without a bonus so uh just quickly i want to talk a little bit about <laughs> the end of percival lowell's lifetime um so he um Got wind of the search for Planet X, which we mm. talked about. Uh, I talked about pretty thoroughly with uh, Kevin Schindler in the Clyde Tombaugh episode because uh, Clyde Tombaugh God, was the one who him. found Pluto. Yeah. But uh, Percival, he actually spent the last 10 years of his life searching for Pluto. And um, there's a lot of um, – I found a lot of stuff about uh, the end of Percival Lowell's lifetime because uh, Percival, he actually died from a stress stroke at a fairly young age. Mm-hmm. And um, there are theories that – uh, the search for Planet X not going as well as he wanted it to, uh, people criticizing his work on Mars, uh, people criticizing his observatory, things like that happening, as well as uh, this is when the start of the World War happened. Right. And Percival Lowell was a devout pacifist. And so I his love him so much heart just now. couldn't take it. Like, oh. that's what a lot of people said, honestly. I was reading, like, quotes from people and everything, and a lot of people said they think that genuinely, like – the war was such a stressor on him that he had a stroke and died because of it. So, Baby. yeah. Aww. So Percival Lowell, he passed away in uh, 1916 at age 61. Um, mm-hmm. and so, so he did. He never met uh, uh, Clyde. He never met Clyde. No, mm-hmm. Clyde came here uh, years later. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, so that is the story of Percival Lowell. Um, Percival was a very interesting guy, a very charismatic guy. Um, And yeah, if you guys want to know more, uh, hit us up in our Discord. Uh, Thank you guys so much for listening. And yeah, uh, yeah, join our Discord. It's really fun. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye. This podcast was made possible by our members and donors. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support our nonprofit in making more digital education like this available, go to lowell.edu slash donate. Thanks for listening.